I'm Zoltan Grossman, and uh, although I'm a professor at the Evergreen State College in Native Studies, I don't study Native people. I mainly study the white people, um, the Native, non-Native relationship, be it U.S. tribal relations, be it uh, relationships between reservation communities and border towns, especially around issues of climate change, fossil fuels, mining. And I've been really encouraged. Uh, it took me about 20 years to work uh, on this project. Did about 120 interviews uh, with tribal leaders, some of the, uh, the rural white uh, neighbors of the, of the tribes. And I came away uh, with a really hopeful, um, a real hopeful feeling. And uh, then I started teaching. <laughs> and I really couldn't do much with it because I was so damn busy teaching. Um, and then uh, returned to this really when a lot of these issues started coming to the forefront um, in around 2014 with the Cowboy Indian Alliance against the Keystone XL pipeline, with all of the movements in this region against the coal and oil terminals, with Standing Rock. And uh, then finally with the, the Trump election, which really brings out a lot of these questions in ways that they haven't before of the consciousness of uh, the rural white population and, uh, and uh, where we're going with that. So I just want to open up um, with a little bit from the introduction to give you a sense of what, uh, of what my book is about and where um, I came from uh, in this work. In Minnesota in 1978, I covered a farmer's environmental rally for a high school student newspaper. The white farmers were protesting against a high voltage electrical transmission line that crossed their lands. The farmers had been joined for the first time by Native Americans who opposed the mining of coal on treaty lands in North Dakota to generate the electricity in the transmission lines. Next to the rally site, I saw two red pickup trucks parked side by side. One pickup had the bumper sticker, the West wasn't one with a registered gun. The other pickup, more beat up, sported a bumper sticker that read, Custer had it coming. At the end of the rally, the white farmer and the Native American drove off in their trucks with these very different messages attached. At the same time around the Umatilla Reservation in Oregon, tribal members were in an intense conflict with white farmers and ranchers over their treaty rights to dwindling water resources. The Umatilla and other Pacific Northwest tribal nations were also locked in a seemingly life or death struggle with white fishers over their newly recognized treaty rights to harvest fish. Yet the Umatilla began to cooperate with white farmers and ranchers over improving water flows in order to restore endangered fish runs with non-Indian fishing groups to breach hydropower dams and protect fish habitat and with state and federal agencies on protecting natural resources from environmental harm. I actually have, I love this photo of uh, the Alliance, the spirit of the Alliance, uh, the Cowboy Indian Alliance. But I also have, um, let's see here a couple of maps. I, I'm a geographer, so we always have to have maps to show you where some of these things are. Just as the Pacific Northwest fishing crises began to be resolved, another treaty confrontation erupted in northern Wisconsin. In the late 1980s, crowds of white sportsmen and sportswomen gathered to harass and assault Ojibwe or Chippewa exercising their court-recognized treaty rights to spearfish outside the reservations. Yet by the mid-1990s, tribal members were working together with sport fishing groups to protect the same fish from proposed metallic mine projects, using some of the same treaty and sovereign rights that the sportsmen and sportswomen had previously opposed. For the first time, local governments began to cooperate with tribal nations not only to protect the fish, but to develop sustainable economies. Witnessing such unlikely alliances drove me to study why native nations and rural European American residents, archetypal enemies in past and present conflicts, would find common cause to defend their mutual place. In the 1970s to the 2010s, similar alliances brought together native peoples and rural white resource users in areas of the country where no one would have predicted or even imagined them. Farmers, ranchers, commercial fishers, and sport fishers had been virtually at war with native nations over the control of land and resources. Yet members of the communities unexpectedly came together to protect the environment from an outside threat. The evolution went through 
four general and often overlapping stages. First, native peoples asserted their autonomy and renewed nationhood. Second, a right-wing populist backlash from some rural whites created racial conflict over the use of land, water, or natural resources. Third, the racial conflict declined in intensity as the neighbors initiated dialogue over common threats to land and water. Fourth, native and white neighbors collaborated on the protection of their community livelihood and natural resources using a cross-cultural anti-corporate populism. The neighbors felt that if they continued to contest the place, to fight over resources, there may not be any left to fight over. These native, non-native environmental alliances, like the anti-treaty groups before them, began in the Pacific Northwest in the 1970s, grew into the Great Basin and Northern Plains, and gradually reached the Great Lakes. They've included native, non-native alliances confronting mines, dams, logging, nuclear waste, military projects, oil pipelines, coal and oil terminals, and other environmental threats. Natives and non-natives in each area took different paths from conflict to cooperation and experienced varied levels of success in improving relations. And I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, some of the implications of these alliances I think resonate even beyond native studies or uh, native, non-native activism uh, into kind of our current moment. Most importantly, the alliances offer important insights into the relationship between particularism and universalism. In the modern North American context, particularism asserts the particular differences between ethnic racial groups and other groups based on gender, sexual preference, and other social identities. In the US, particularism is often called identity politics, a clearly inadequate term given that native nations have a distinct relationship to the larger society on the basis of not only their cultural identities, but also their particular political and territorial histories. Conservative and progressive pundits alike have opposed particularist politics as emphasizing group differences over similarities, as balkanizing US society into distinct enclaves or even as dangerously separatist. Universalism asserts common ground or the similarities between people that claim inherent differences. Universalism, which could also be called unity politics, has often been used to describe the common bond of state citizenship that theoretically at least treats all citizens equally. To socialists, universalism means different ethnic or racial groups uniting around their class consciousness. To feminists, it may mean women from different class or cultural backgrounds uniting around their gender identity. To environmentalists, it means human beings from different backgrounds coming together to defend the earth. Universalism usually gets better press than particularism because it brings together disparate groups in a common cause, overcoming insurmountable odds to work in harmony. Yet the glowing media accounts do not explain that even in the midst of the most successful alliances, social inequalities continue to rear their heads. Most scholars and activists assume that particularist movements asserting identity differences automatically contradict universalist movements emphasizing similarities in human experiences, such as environmental concerns. Scholars and politicians usually portray particularist movements around the world as barriers to greater cross-cultural understanding. They ask so-called minority groups to subsume their identities within a universalist framework in the interest of unity or the greater good of Earth and humankind. The solution, we're told, is to build diversity, to, build to, get, to bring together whites and people of color in social institutions so they can better understand each other. This approach sometimes is embodied in slogans such as e pluribus unum, united we stand, or all lives matter. The universalist perspective often portrays group conflict as the result of groups floating in a social vacuum, accidentally bumping into the other who we don't like only because they're different. But we don't live within a social vacuum. U.S. society has always been based on a racialized hierarchy, a pecking order of power relations determined by a mixture of class, gender, nationality, and skin color. This institutionalized system is not simply based on people not liking each other, but creates or deepens differences to keep people within their place in the hierarchy. Diversity is a laudable goal, but it usually takes the form of adding a few brown or black faces to white majority institutions, legitimizing them as multicultural without changing underlying power relations. 
Both proponents and opponents of identity politics often offer a stark choice between self-determination and unity. Yet particularity and universality are not necessarily in contradiction, nor are they either or propositions. The two are not mutually exclusive. In fact, true unity will not work without self-determination, and self-determination will be difficult to win without some connections to the experiences and concerns of at least some whites. Many universalist movements, such as the global human rights and environmental movements, had their origins in particular local settings. Some indigenous movements, such as the Zapatistas in Mexico or anti-corporate protesters in Bolivia, have successfully mixed particularist appeals to reverse the colonization of indigenous peoples with universalist class-based appeals to the non-native poor. Particularist movements face the risk of local isolation and a failure to confront national or global systems that are the ultimate source of their problems. Universalist movements face the risk of abstracting or homogenizing local differences and locking in inequalities within a unified society. But the two concepts can be interwoven to emphasize the strengths and overcome the shortcomings of each. Real unity around larger causes is made possible by a process of equalization. Particularist movements can help level the playing field between the communities by fighting not only for their own rights but for wider social change. To achieve unity, the majority needs to understand how recognizing and respecting difference can benefit universal values. Native, non-native environmental alliances are an example of a movement that, consciously or not, has creatively negotiated the tensions between particularity and universality and has attempted to interweave them by identifying native self-determination as a way to protect the land and water for everyone. So I promise that's all the theory you're gonna get um, today because uh, I think the stories are uh, a lot more compelling. So I um, started um, in this work um, in South Dakota um, when I was a teenager in the late 1970s uh, in a group called the Black Hills Alliance. Many of you know about the uh, Siege of Wounded Knee in 1973 and how that polarized uh, South Dakota. There was intense racism. Only six years later, there was an alliance in the Black Hills, the sacred Hesapa, to protect the hills from uh, coal and uranium mining. And uh, this brought together thousands of people. This is very much a precedent to what we saw later in Standing Rock. Um, I was there as an 18 year old uh, with peach fuzz, um, <laughs> uh, looking pretty much exactly the same as I do today. Um, this was a photo from uh, the New York Times Magazine and uh, uh, we had uh, around that same time 11,000 people at a gathering on the spread of one of the ranchers, uh, Marv Kammer, and uh, successfully stopped the coal and uranium mining in the Black Hills in 1980-81. And uh, that was a real success and nobody could understand how that could have happened in such a polarized atmosphere. Um, some years later, 87, the Honeywell Corporation wanted to have a uh, bombing range in a sacred canyon with uh, ancient petroglyphs. And many of the Lakota elders from Pine Ridge, from Rosebud, set up a teepee camp. And they found that they had support from the local white ranchers. And uh, they together formed a group called the Cowboy and Indian Alliance with the poignant acronym CIA. Um, <laughs> and they found that the um, support that they were getting was largely based on the name, the media attention. They were getting more attention for their name than they were for the issue itself. And, uh, and they chased out Honeywell within a few months. Not only that, but the land became a wild horse sanctuary, a uh, refuge for Mustangs from BLM lands that had been rounded up or other Mustangs that were um, not treated very well. So um, this was another example um, in uh, around the early 2000s, there was a proposal for a coal railroad, much like the ones that have been proposed here in the Northwest. And they came together um, a second time as the Cowboy and Indian Alliance too. And of course, we probably all know about the third iteration of the CIA um, in 2013 to oppose the Keystone XL pipeline. 
bringing Alberta tar sands um, uh, down through South Dakota and Nebraska. And this time, quite a few of the farmers and ranchers in South Dakota and Nebraska joined together uh, with uh, Lakota, Pawnee, Ponca, and others. And in the name of one of them, uh, leader in Dakota Rural Ac Action, um, he found out that the tribes uh, were going after state and federal land, not so much private land, and that uh, he began to read the treaty and realized that if he uh, was native, that he would doing, be doing the same thing. And so a lot of the people who were not aware of treaty rights became aware through these struggles and then began to learn a lot more. Um, and of course, this is the rally in uh, Washington, D.C. in uh, 2014 that uh, got the uh, attention of the uh, Obama administration. And of course, um, uh, Trump wants to restart it up. He's f f uh, facing the same kind of opposition. And I asked, uh, I interviewed Faith Spotted Eagle, uh, he, he Hong Tong Wan, uh, Nakota Dakota uh, elder leader, and Jane Klebb of um, of Bold, Nebraska, and uh, Chief Phil Lane, others. What was the pivotal moment? I'm really interested in the first moments of how these bridges get built. Who invites who? Who invites who to the table? What do they learn from the process? Is it simply a, um, uh, a short-term kind of um, um, uh, movement, or do they actually learn in the process? So um, this is uh, what I was told about the uh, uh, the key moment, the key turning point in the alliance occurred in January 2013 when indigenous nations and their allies held the gathering to protect the sacred from the tar sands and Keystone XL at the Yankton Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. The gathering was held to commemorate the signing of an 1863 peace treaty between the Pawnee and Yankton Wan or Yankton Nakota Dakota nations to stand together against the United States and white settlers. The gathering helped to bring uh, build bridges between First Nations, tribes, farmers and ranchers, business people and environmentalists fighting Keystone XL on both sides of the US Canada border. The gathering culminated in the International Treaty to Protect the Sacred, signed first by the sovereign nations, six First Nations and four US tribal governments, and then by agricultural and environmental allies. He hung on one Nakota Dakota Chief Phil Lane Jr. said, we've achieved this not only with our indigenous relatives who've joined us here, but also with our relatives, the ranchers and farmers who treasure Mother Earth as we do. In recalling that she invited Jane Klebb of Bold, Nebraska to come up and bring the ranchers, Spotted Eagle said, it was really a historical time because they were very emotional and you could see the impact. And I think that broke through to the native folks because there's always been that historical trauma and fear. When it came to the land and water, it just became natural common ground. And it's been a real powerful friendship that developed out of there. I think it's an important crossroads in history. At Spotted Eagle's suggestion, the gathering participants began to use the name Cowboy Indian Alliance to describe the loose affiliation, although only some of the Lakota activists were aware of the earlier incarnations of the CIA. Chief Phil Lane recalled the pivotal moment in, in detail, and these are his words. Those ranchers came in and spoke to that council and they shared their heart. So finally, we came back after the treaty signing, we had about 10 or 15 ranchers there, they all got up to speak, and one after another, they got up and said they're infuriated. They said, how could this happen? How can people take our land? How can they do this to us? And of course, we didn't see a smile, but everyone knew what we was thinking about from our side. So finally, this last sister got up to speak, and she just said, I'm just so infuriated. They're coming and taking our land. They can just do it without our consent. This is our land that our families have, been in, have lived in since, you know, how long they've been there and said, they're treating us just like, just like, and then one of the relatives said, just like the Indians. And all of a sudden there was this beautiful pause and everybody's like, yes. And one of my relatives walked over to her and says, welcome to the tribe, welcome to the tribe. Nebraska, uh, Nebraska rancher Tom Janung, whose li ranch lies two miles from the pipeline route, remembered the Trini signing as the first time he had been invited uh, to a reservation. Um, to be invited, that was exciting. Uh, the original, uh, or they realized they had to get together and stand together. 
Um, and the reason they were doing that is we wanted to protect the land for the next seven generations. The alliance deepened through a series of spiritual camps, including the Ponca Trail of Tears spiritual camp held in November 2013 on the northeastern Nebraska farm of Art and Helen Tandrup on the route to Oklahoma of both the Ponca Trail and the Keystone XL pipeline. The participants jointly laid flowers at the gravesite of an 18-month-year-old girl who had died on the Ponca Trail of Tears in Neli where the townspeople had for 136 years honored her father's request to tend to her grave. Ponca tribal la members later planted sacred corn in the path of Keystone XL at Neli in their original homeland. The Ponca and Pawnee had been working with Nebraska gardeners for several years to plant in their original homeland their rare heirloom native corn, which could not grow on their post-removal lands in Oklahoma. Ponca grandfather Mikasi Hornick commented, living on the res, it's usually us against them. You kind of grow up with that mentality. The pipeline is dividing the land, but it's bringing people together. Ponca, Lakota, Omaha, and white participants brought their families, gathered around a sacred fire, shared meals, and told stories that created deeper bonds than uh, meetings about technical or legal aspects of the pipeline did. Kleb noted, the meal times were great because you would sit around the fire and eat the food that was being made all day. It's when everyone would take a deep breath and do business with each other. The recurring irony in the alliance, of course, is that the ranchers have been fighting against the corporate theft of their private property that their pioneer forebears had themselves stolen from native people. Nebraska landowner Randy Thompson opposed TransCanada's confiscation of his property because the company didn't earn the land. They didn't carry heavy milk buckets and walk through the snow and slop like my mom did. Using the same criteria of hardship and survival on the land, the tribal members should still retain their previous ownership of the same grassy hills that the settlers later homesteaded. Ponca elder Casey Camp Hornick agreed that the ranchers are suffering under things like eminent domain and that they too have had their lifestyles impinged upon by these major corporations. But she said that in the early CIA meetings with the ranchers, we pulled no punches with them about how the land they live on now became land that they could buy and sell. It was our blood. She insisted it's part of their history as well, of, as, well as ours. And it has to be brought out and spoken of, or else there isn't an alliance. Camp Hornick holds out hope. The people that we are aligning ourselves with, I really believe that they're going to help us uphold these treaty rights. And Jane Kleb asserted in her words, even with the property rights from farmers and ranchers' perspective, it's because they don't want the government and the corporations overdeveloping that land for corporate gain. What the farmers and ranchers believe is that what they're doing is feeding people and they feel a deep responsibility to that land because their ancestors had homesteaded on it. It's a difficult thing to grapple with as you start to understand on an emotional level the history of that place, the pictures that we have in our living rooms of our homesteaders' families that did take tribes' land away. It's difficult to grapple with it. All of us see that as the reality, but now we have a responsibility to keep passing that land down to future generations. She concluded, the tribes and the farmers and the ranchers all share this very spiritual connection to the land we live on. Working together, we've been getting past this horrible thing that happened between the families that were homesteading on the land and the tribes. We've been coming together to protect the land. It's been a chance for healing. And Faith Spotted Eagle agreed. We come from two cultures that clashed over land, and so this is healing for generations. And of course, uh, they were successful in 2015 in blocking the northern leg of the pipeline that Trump is now trying to uh, restart and of course has, has rekindled um, that opposition. So uh, when um, Debbie and I went to Standing Rock in um, September of 2016 um, and witnessed uh, some of the lockdowns, some of the direct actions that were taking place, also witnessed the very beautiful um, canoe journey, the Pacific Northwest uh, canoes that arrived there on the Missouri and Cannonball Rivers in a, in a, um, a gesture of respect and honoring. Um, I, I thought it was beautiful to see how the different um, tribes have come together, even historic enemies, and saw a lot of friends from the Black Hills Alliance days and um, uh, a lot of friends from the American Indian Movement. Um, but very quickly that situation became very militarized 
And I think the situation, even though we're very cl uh, close to that border, North Dakota, South Dakota border, um, North Dakota is a petro state. It's very repressive. Its economy is completely based on oil fracking. And so it was much more difficult in North Dakota. And I think the authorities in North Dakota realized that they had to prevent what had happened with the Cowboy and Indian Alliance coming together in, um, uh, in South Dakota. And they did so systematically. And seeing the roadblock in particular on Highway 6, which at the time we were there was taken over from the police to the National Guard, actually as part of a research project, got a lot of the internal documents from the uh, North Dakota Highway Patrol. Um, and uh, you could really see how the non the roadblock was obviously to keep um, Native people from reaching the camps, was an uh, economic blockade of the reservation. I'm also convinced that it was a way to prevent non-Native people from going to the camps by criminalizing and demonizing the water protectors and physically causing people to drive about 60, 70 miles out of their way to get groceries, um, to go to the doctor, go to, for kidney dialysis, and deliberately stoke that kind of resentment. And of course, by fast-tracking the, the project as well. Um, uh, instead of the very slow process that Keystone XL had gone through, I think that they were very conscious that they wanted to prevent a fourth Cowboy Indian Alliance from developing. And of course, we saw that outcome. So I wanted to um, move on to um, another case study, which is a couple of chapters in the book, and that's um, in northern Wisconsin. And um, we were in a situation in northern Wisconsin, um, Debbie and I were uh, involved in uh, the Midwest Treaty Network, which was trying to draw attention to the attacks on Ojibwe treaty rights uh, from uh, white sportsmen, uh, sportswomen that were uh, throwing rocks. Uh, um, there was sniper fire. There were all sorts of physical attacks and, uh, and media attacks against um, uh, against Ojibwe uh, practicing their off-reservation treaty rights, much like here uh, 15 years before, and uh, very open displays of racism, uh, and mobs of people, hundreds of people, sometimes thousands of people at night, uh, during the spring, during the sp walleye sp uh, spearfishing season. Of course, they never took more than 3% of the walleye. What we found interesting, even at the time, was that there were some of the sportsmen who not the leadership, but the people who were there because they actually believed that the Ojibwe were harming the fishery and thus harming the tourism-based economy of northern Wisconsin, which is poor, a lot like eastern Washington or eastern Oregon, um, and, uh, and began to dialogue with some of the spearfishing families about some of the real threats to the resources, such as mining companies coming in. And it was around the same time that the mining companies who assumed that people were so racially divided that they wouldn't come together to oppose their plans began to uh, uh, plan a series of mines in the ceded territory uh, of northern Wisconsin. And of course, there are a lot of concerns, environmental concerns about sulfuric acids. There are economic concerns, boom and bust. Cultural concerns about the wild rice, um, the, uh, the trout in the streams. And um, what I found fascinating uh, was that there was a certain area of northern Wisconsin where the little crosses are, where the clashes, the physical clashes um, of the sportsmen uh, opposing uh, the, the tribal members from fishing. Um, they were most intense around the Lac de Flambeau and Mole Lake uh, reservations. There was uh, another area around the Le Couture reservation where the tribe had uh, asserted its rights in court, but when they won, really didn't push it outside the reservation. Uh, they were afraid of alienating some of the white resort owners who really didn't push um, uh, the spearfishing. And so you would think when the mining companies came in, it would be a lot easier to form an alliance around Le Couture where there hadn't been much of a conflict, and it would be much more difficult to form an alliance around the places where native people and, and whites were really polarized and at each other's throats. What happened though was exactly the opposite. 
um, completely counterintuitive was that there was a, a, an alliance against a planned mine around Le Couture, uh, but it was unsuccessful, and the local white population really didn't get that involved in it. Um, and conversely, uh, next to both uh, Lac du Flambeau and Mole Lake, um, the alliances were very quick to form, were very strong, and were successful. And so I was really intrigued by this. Um, why is it that in areas of conflict, you might have the seeds of greater cooperation than in areas where there hadn't been? Um, and so I kind of, through the course of these interviews, came to the conclusion, the stronger the sovereignty, the stronger the alliance. And not only that, but there are leaders such as Walter Brissett at Redcliffe, who at the time said, um, a very um, uh, forward-looking, said, we have more in common with the anti-Indian people than we do with the state of Wisconsin that was allowing these mining projects to go forward. And so we were fighting the Crandon uh, mine next to the Mole Lake Reservation, which is a homeland of wild rice upstream from the Wolf River, which is an important trout stream. Um, it brought together a number of tribes. Um, it brought together um, the three different um, components of the alliance, the Native Nations, both downstream and downwind, the sport fishing clubs who started to slowly get involved and environmental groups. So I um, wanted to talk about a group that um, uh, Debbie and I um, uh, w was involved in, um, in, uh, let's see, in 1996. The mine site at Mo Lake was uh, five miles upwind of the Forest County Potawatomi community and 40 miles upstream via the Sacred Wolf River of the Menominee Nation. Those tribes joined with Stockbridge Muncie uh, to join the Niwin tribes, using the Ojibwe word for four, in opposing the mine. At a 1993 anti-mining conference in Ashland, Mole Lake and Menominee officials asked the Midwest Treaty Network to take on political organizing around the Crandon mine, while the tribes would do the legal, technical, and spiritual work necessary to protect the water. The network formed the Wolf Watershed Educational Project as a campaign to organize native and non-native communities downstream from the proposed mine site. The um, Wolf Watershed Educational Project began in 1996, a series of speaking tours along the Wolf and Wisconsin rivers to organize communities against the Crandon Project. At the 22 towns visited by the first tour, representatives of tribes, environmental groups, and sport fishing groups spoke, drawing about 1,100 people. Instead of sending the speakers only to address their own constituencies, organizers decided to show all three parts of the alliance at each of the stops. Some of the sport fishers in the audience heard a tribal me member speak for the first time in their lives. At one tour spot, a stop at a meeting of the Merrill Sportsman's Club, a Mole Lake tribal member even won the door prize. The speaking tour culminated with a rally at the mining company's local headquarters in Rhinelander attended by a thousand people. Uh, the series of speaking tours resulted in small grassroots anti-mine groups being formed along the rivers and around the state. Dave Bluen of the Mining Impact Coalition said, one of our goals is to cement some of those relationships where people were at each other's throats not very long ago and to help them understand they have more in common than they realize. Mole Lake Tribal Judge Fred Ackley, um, here with, uh, well, I call this the Chippewa Cheesehead Alliance, um, um, uh, here with one of the people from Shano. Uh, was one of the main tour speakers and had often, often offered guidance at Alliance meetings. Um, when he lived in Milwaukee, he had helped to manufacture mining equipment. Francis Van Zyl, his companion, was a feisty defender of fishing and hunting traditions who urged women to join the Alliance as keepers of the water. The tour speakers also included a trio of elderly f trout fishermen from White Lake, downstream on the Wolf River in Langlade County. Herb Bittner was the owner of the Wild Wolf Inn Resort, treasured by rafters and kayakers who shot the white water raf rapids of the Wolf River. He served as president of the Wolf River Chapter of Trout Unlimited and as chairman of the Langley County Republican Party. For decades, he'd protected the Wolf River from dams and waste dumps. The successful battles contributed to the 1968 federal declaration of a portion of the river as a national wild and scenic river. 
In the 1990s, Bittner was so disgusted with the pro-mine stance of Republican Governor Tommy Thompson that he removed his campaign literature from the party table at the county fair and replaced it with anti-Exxon literature. George Rock was a retired engineer with a biting wit who lived with his wife Marilyn in an 1872 log cabin downstream on the Wolf River and served as vice president of the TU chapter. Though he did not live in Nashville, he served as an important bridge between the white residents and local tribal members he had met when his father had been a local school teacher. Bob Schmitz was a white-bearded, retired telephone workers union president from Green Bay where he'd become experienced in the art of rank and file organizing. As an avid hunter and fisher, he kept a cabin in White Lake um, and joined fellow World War II veteran um, Menominee Sparky Wacaw in a mutual love of the river. Schmidt's gruff language and colorful humor punctuated Alliance meetings. Native and white elders were joined by younger activists concerned about the growth of corporate power. University of Wisconsin students from Stevens Point, including Dana Chernus and Deanna Erickson, whose sister is right over here, attended anti-globalization protests around the country, but returned home, including here in Seattle, and, but returned home to assist the local people power movement in their own backyard. At Alliance meetings, they listened as Ackley and Bittner stood to speak about the environment and democracy, drawing from their respective oral traditions. The Wolf Watershed Educational Project meetings were held monthly at different reservations and border towns and brought together organizers face-to-face -face in one circle. That's face-to-face, -face, not Facebook. According to organizer Deborah McNutt over here, the hosting group would provide a potluck lunch sharing food and giving people the opportunity to get to know one another. Participants often brought birthday cakes and passed around cards for those who were ill. They also sent sympathy cards to the different executive teams that revolved in and out of the mining company, advising them to rent, don't buy their homes because their stay would be temporary. <laughs> McNutt recalled that Bittner would tell others at the meeting, I feel closer to you people than, than to people I attend church with on Sundays. The anti-mine movement epitomized Wisconsin's history of progressive populism and, and of rural conservation ethics, represented by John Muir and Aldo Leopold. It harnessed northern resentment of state agencies in Madison, usually a conservative strategy. It also drew from the historic resilience and perseverance of native nations. In poor logging communities such as Forest County, like let's say Grays Harbor County, Resource companies have been able to portray mainstream urban-based white environmental activists as yuppies or hippies who do not care about rural jobs. Mining companies attempted to pit white residents against native people, environmentalists against union members building mining equipment, and rural northerners against urban residents and students. But they failed each time to divide Wisconsinites by race, by class, or by region. What mining companies faced along the Wolf River was something new an environmental movement that was rural-based, middle-class and working-class, intergenerational and multiracial. The Wolf Watershed Educational Project never met during deer hunting season because nearly all of its members' families hunted. This movement addressed not just a corporation's environmental threats, but also its threats to rural cultures, local economies, and democratic institutions, and drew in former f followers of the anti-treaty movements. Um, including a, a Rhinelander fishing guide named Wally Cooper, who we were very surprised to see at one of our meetings, but he was listening. So the, uh, the mining industry was terrified about this. This didn't fit their preconceptions, their training manuals, their workshops. Um, they began to describe us as um, making permitting a mine in Wisconsin an impossibility. Uh, they were afraid that our websites would spread propaganda around the world. They called us barbarians at the gates of cyberspace, which I really liked. Uh, my favorite one was the Fraser Institute up in Vancouver um, uh, grades every country, state, and province in the entire world for, to their receptivity to the mining industry. And Wisconsin got a score dead last, 13 out of 100 which we're very happy about. Washington was, by the way, in second to last place. Um, so by 2003, uh, not only did the two tribes defeat the mine, uh, but actually using some of their gaming proceeds, one had a large casino, one a small one, 
um, but at the price of just the land. They bought that property, but just at the price of the surface, not even taking into account the largest zinc copper deposit in all of North America worth many billions. And so this was the victory, the regime change, some people called it at the time. Uh, they divided up the uh, land between the two tribes. They're using it to um, uh, uh, protect the natural and cultural resources. This was a celebration of the alliance. This was a cartoon in the paper the next day of the tribes and, and sportsmen together. So really, the spearfishing conflict, uh, I'm convinced, um, overcame the invisibility of the tribe, forced rural whites to acknowledge the continuing strong culture and legal standing of the tribes and uh, contributed to unity, that the differences aided the similarities. The treaty rights conflict opened up the path to environmental cooperation. As Fran Van Zyl said, this is my home. When it's your home, you take good care of it, um, uh, including all the people in it. Now, having said that, there was also um, alliances in Wisconsin that didn't work out so well. I want to just briefly address one of them in uh, the Ho-Chunk Nation in southern Wisconsin, where there was a very strong movement against the National Guard uh, doing low-level flights of jets over dairy country, over Amish country. The Amish even got involved in opposing it because their horses would buck and run with the buggies. Um, and uh, so there's a very strong alliance for a while. And there was also a Ho-Chunk-led, tribal-led alliance against the expansion of a bombing range linked to the low-level flights. But what the, um, what the National Guard did was very intelligent uh, in a, 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 a coercive kind of way, or sneaky kind of way, is that they dropped the, uh, the low-level flight plan that affected mainly white farmers and kept the bombing range expansion that affected mainly the Ho-Chunk. And some of the white farmers celebrated with the barn dance and, and basically sold out their allies. So those divide and conquer strategies will happen. They always do happen and people have to be prepared. And in closing, I'd like to talk about what uh, has been one of the, um, the most successful uh, alliances uh, that we've been involved in. I think people have heard about uh, Lummi opposing the coal terminal, but a lot of people in Seattle don't know too much about what the Quinault Nation has been doing in uh, stopping the oil terminals um, out by Grays Harbor, an area a lot like northern Wisconsin. I don't have to give you a lot of the background about the Bolt decision, about state tribal co-management, uh, and some of the successes that have uh, taken place, including Nisqually becoming the lead entity in devising um, habitat restoration plans in their watershed. I also probably don't have to tell this crowd <laughs> about how uh, shipping is the Achilles heel of the uh, fossil fuel industry, be it trains or pipelines, and how we're a choke point, the thin green line, um, between the fossil fuel basins and the global market. Um, so there's been the success at, um, at Lummi. Uh, there's been the opposition to the exploding oil trains, including many of you here in, in Seattle. I made this map to show some of the connections between um, the Bakken oil basin in North Dakota and uh, Washington. I also made a conceptual map <laughs> when there was a blockade in Olympia of an uh, oil fracking uh, propens train that kind of shows conceptually all of the different connections coming out from the Bakken. But uh, what's been amazing uh, is to see the transformation in Grays Harbor County. And this is what I want to end with, um, is uh, the fight uh, of, uh, of Quinault uh, and against the um, against three, uh, three terminals. Up to 50 oil trains a month, each a mile and a half long, would supply up to three proposed Grays Harbor oil terminals in Hoquiam where Bakken oil would be loaded into e enormous tankers next to key migrating bird habitat. The Quinault Indian Nation and Grays Harbor residents became concerned about the effects of an oil tanker, tanker spill on local fisheries and shellfish beds. Quinault Treaty territory extends into Grays Harbor and the coastal reservation is famed for its pristine beaches, razor clams and blueback sockeye sa salmon. Collaboration between the Quinault and Grays Harbor environmental groups had extended back to, to 2008. 
when Joe Schumacher, Marine Resources Scientist for the Quinault Department of Fisheries, was the tribal liaison on the Grace Harbor Marine Resource Committee. He kept in contact with the Friends of Grace Harbor and Grace Harbor Audubon, as well as the Citizens for a Clean Harbor, which had defeated a proposed coal terminal in 2012, only to face three proposed oil terminals later the same year. Um, a consolidated appeal by the Quinault, Sierra Club's Earth Justice, and local environmental groups convinced the State Shoreline Hearings Board in 2013 to revoke the Department of Ecology permits for two of the terminals, pending a state environmental impact statement. Nearly unanimous public opposition began to emerge in 2014 during a series of ecology hearings along the proposed train route. On the morning he passed away that year, Billy Frank Jr. supported the Quinault stand in his last blog. It's clear that crude oil can be explosive and the tankers used to transport it by rail are simply unsafe. Everyone knows that oil and water don't mix and neither do oil and fish. It's not a matter of whether spills will happen, it's a matter of when. Fawn Sharp, president of the Quinault Nation agreed, not all of the oil gets cleaned up no matter how good the effort. The Grays Harbor community had historically been hostile to outside mainstream environmentalists, whom they blamed for the closure of local timber mills during the Northwest Spotted Owl Wars. Working only with earth justice would reinforce that perception, but Quinault leaders made a point of working also with local environmental groups and fishermen, and pushing a no oil trains message on local billboards and in newspapers. As Quinault Vice President Tyson Johnston commented, some local residents will lump us in too with a lot of the environmental groups, and we do carry a lot of those values, but we're in this for very different reasons, such as sovereignty, our future generations. Quinault leaders also point out that climate change, generated by the burning of fossil fuels, has detrimentally affected salmon and shellfish for both Quinault and non-tribal fishers, the kind of work that Terry and Preston are involved in at Tulalip. The Quinault Nation had usually been at odds with the Washington Dungeness Crab Fishermen's Association, which has challenged treaty-backed crab harvests. But as Association Vice President Larry Thievik pointed out about the oil terminal issue, it's united us in the preservation of the resource that we bicker over. It has also created a new channel of communication because those of us at the bottom of the food chain, the actual fishers, have been able to talk somewhat directly to another nation. Schumacher, the Quinault Nation Marine Resources Scientist, agreed, with no resource, there's no battle. We have to maintain what's out there. Those people, those local crabbers out here, are almost as place-based as the tribes. I'll never say that they're as place-based, but they feel so deeply rooted here and as part of their lives, we find ourselves working together. Quinault President Fawn Sharp, also president of the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians, where uh, Debbie and I were a couple of days ago in Portland, was born in 1970 at the height of the fishing rights conflict. I was a young child, but was very impressionable. At eight years old, I understood what treaty abrogation meant, that there were others trying to wipe out the entire livelihood of not only my family, but my larger Quinault family. That was very real. My perspective is a product of that era. Sharp reflected, part of the relationship that we have today arose out of generation of disputes. Through these disputes, whether they liked us, didn't like us, they came to know and understand Quinault and our values. For us, a lot of the relationships we have with our neighbors arose out of a relationship of much division, strife, and conflict, but through that, they've come to know who we are. To me, that's a foundational bit of understanding. Sharp was later impressed in meeting Larry Thievik and other local crabbers, uh, when they agreed to work together with Quinault, even as they agreed to disagree about harvest, crab harvest allocation. When the oil terminal issue emerged, Sharp thought, we need to develop these partnerships because this oil issue is so much larger than the Quinault Nation. Adding a footnote, a footnote of hope, she said, the cooperation that we're now seeing is going to provide another sort of step of maturity and good faith and alliance and looking beyond special interest or individual interest to the greater good. Perhaps today's generation and younger people growing up in this political climate will come to understand that it's so much better to work together with neighbors. And um, they had the uh, shared water, shared values um, rally in July 2016 
uh, in Hoquiam, including a flotilla of fishing boats, tribal canoes, and kayaks. Notably, the rallies roster highlighted tribal and local non-native speakers, but none from outside environmental groups that they spoke later in an in open mic. And I think this was a, a very interesting way to do it. And I think, um, you know, Quinault's uh, success, because the three oil terminals have now been completely defeated, you can't find anyone in Aberdeen and Hoquiam that admits to having supported them um, uh, back a couple years ago. And um, I think what we're seeing now is, um, uh, the situation where we've had in the Northwest uh, very much a government-to-government uh, -government relationship that's been more successful elsewhere in the country. and um, But where sometimes cooperation comes from the top down and doesn't always filter into the local communities and takes some time in doing so. And we also see that in the Columbia Basin around the hydropower dams. In Wisconsin, we face the exact opposite situation where you had great cooperation at the grassroots, but very little government-to-government -government cooperation because of intransigent politicians, and they can always sabotage that kind of thing. What, what I see in the Northwest case studies is parallel tracks of government-to-government -government relations and people-to-people -people relationships that can reinforce each other, and that is really the most powerful way um, to do it. So. Um, I wanted to uh, just see if there are any questions, and of course we can also um, talk over uh, book signing, but uh, we've got a lot of uh, wisdom and experience and history in the room, so I really wanted to hear from some of you. So thank you.
come a long way with them, and uh, they're now our friends rather than our enemies, and we're looking at jointly doing land use plans now. But uh, I'm really grateful for the studies that you've shown, and want to talk shit more about it. But I, I think you're on for the direction uh, that, that really needs participation by Tribe Chat to see how we can keep changing our future. Thank you. And. Um the um, previous book that we worked on, Evergreen, Asserting Native Resilience, Pacific Rim Indigenous Nations Face the Climate Crisis, there was uh, there were contributions um, from uh, Terry Preston and others at Tulalip about that local scale that's so important of building those relationships. And one of the incredible stories is of the, the biodigester where um, there was uh, cattle waste, basically shit going in the streams. and. Um, uh, a, a big battle over that uh, to protect the salmon. And uh, it was uh, Terry's brother and others who said, well, why don't we build a biodigester to turn that cattle waste into green energy that the farmers could buy at cheap rates? And that's a pilot project. And that kind of forward thinking of uh, uh, instead of seeing polarization as something permanent, of uh, trying to build those bridges and doing them in practical ways, um, is really revolutionary and so important in the climate crisis uh, context, especially. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when when um, when the thing was going on with Bill Gaffel and um, I'm an advisor at Northern College, and so we had our families. about what's going to happen to them while they need the, the, the fuel, right? And that, um, what do you, why do you guys believe this? You know, and not understanding the ramifications of what will happen with the oil spill. What's going to happen not only to the indigenous people there, uh, the farmers, the people downstream, you know, this is the reality of it. This is just not going to happen just to this small nation. This is a global thing. This is something that's really going to affect us. So we decided to be able to have inform, and so we did bring people who were at the encampment, families, and then we also brought um, uh, uh, our our faculty and to talk about it too, because we wanted it for people to understand, just like you're doing here, from different folds different understanding people who are speaking, you know, um, that you would see indigenous people speaking about the environment and culture, but also bringing faculty to talk about it too. And that, I think, just like this, is really helpful because it made people understand this is culturally, I would say, number one for us. Culturally, number one for us. And all the things that are affecting us is also going to affect the people around our area. You know, so this is this is not where we stand alone. You know, this is not one. This is all. You know, so so uh, I'm very privileged to be able to be here. We, we came into town from uh, Spokane and just got over a pass before it closed. Oh wow. Yeah, and so and uh, and I was here with my son and then I met my friend here and told me told me about this lecture and, and I, I'm very pleased and very happy to listen to you. And definitely going to buy the book because we still have a lot of things that are happening in Spokane with, with the mining and the coal and things like that. And, and to make people understand is that we need to stand together because this is this is this is seven generations and it's not just us indigenous people who this is going to affect. Yeah, and the the idea of Mini Wichoni of Water is Life is such a powerful part of all these alliances. I think that. You know, more recently, that's come into the non-native consciousness, but it's always been there, very strong. And it's one thing that I wanted to say to to non-native um, students who are at Evergreen or other places wanting to go to Standing Rock. I said, "Yeah, it's it's good to go, and it's good to you know um, do what's requested of you by the uh, the tribal members, by the leadership at 
at Standing Rock to be in the camps to help out. But one of the other roles that non-natives have to take is to educate the non-native community and to, um, you know, do some outreach to these farmers and ranchers, to other people in North Dakota, especially if they're from North Dakota. And um, we even, um, myself, Winona LaDuc, and a retired um, Army Colonel Ann Wright actually wrote a letter to um, North Dakota police forces and National Guard saying, uh, you're being given uh, illegal orders and it's your duty to disobey those. And what was interesting is there were a few isolated instances of disobeying and some of the police forces pulled their people out uh, because there was some internal dissension that they didn't want to be there. And there was a lot of dissension back home um, from the taxpayers who didn't want their police to be there. So it's that kind of thing is just as important as going and offering material aid and that's very important. But, uh, um, but um, Native people have a role in the way that, that they do solidarity. Non-Native people also have a responsibility um, to try and shift uh, some of these things because the media is not telling the truth. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for your uh, reading. Um, I don't know a lot of this history, so it's really compelling to hear about these uh, alliances. I was wondering, and you're kind of speaking towards it right now, if you could speak about kind of the current moment that we're living in and what we saw with Standing Rock, with um, kind of towards the end where um, indigenous people were asking people to stop coming if they didn't have skill sets, um, because it became more where Standing Rock was an experience people wanted to be a part of and not actually there to work towards um, mm -hmm. that same goal. And so I was wondering if you had thoughts on how we can as I think this will probably be a, a thing that we deal with now from this moment on, if people want to be parts of experiences, like how do we work towards dealing with that? Yeah, I think um, the people not only at Standing Rock, but throughout the Northern Plains and talking especially about the strategy around Keystone Excel, it's going to be quite different. Um, there will be, you know, camps, there will be direct actions, but it'll be people invite on an invitation basis rather than an open door. and. Um, and that there's a lot that people can do back home, whether it's divestment campaigns, whether it's education, uh, whether it's supporting the local struggles in your own backyard. Because for every struggle that gets a lot of media attention, there are a hundred out there that are struggling to get that attention. And so um, I was really glad in, um, in Olympia when there was a, a now two blockades of trains carrying fracking propens or uh, fracking sands that prop open the cracks during fracking um, uh, by people who are basically acting in solidarity with what was happening in North Dakota. Um, and uh, you know, to basically see those local connections and to build that local movement that's so important. So uh, I think that, that uh, Burning Man phenomenon that you're, um, that you're referring to, I think people learn, learn from that. That's a product of the 2010s social media environment that we're in. And uh, just as the alt-right attacks through social media are, are a phenomenon we now have to deal with. Um, and so I think that people are, are kind of retooling for that. Yeah. Who's a hand up over here? Or? I have one question. Yeah. Uh, you kind of touched on what I was going to ask. Uh, the smaller situations that go on before they become Sandy Rock, size, um, where do you find out about those? I mean, if somebody wanted to take a vacation across America, for instance, mm. they, if they had a specific place to go to on the web, they could find out where all these environmental realities are happening, and they could tour through all of them and find out what's really going on in America, for instance. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> I wish there was one place you could find all that, but uh, I think, uh, you know, f Facebook, for all of its limitations, um, there is a presence of these local groups. So I think to kind of look up the places you'd be going through and see what some of the issues are. There are some uh, sources. High Country News has been a, a, a source that's consistently covered some of these. Um, Indigenous Environmental Network is definitely a place to go. Seventh Generation Fund, other uh, um, potlatch fund in this area. You know, there are, there are a lot of local struggles that are helped along by um, regional or national movements and, and get some exposure through doing that. So. But uh, you know, pay attention to what's going on in your backyard, and then you make that something that people hear about as well. 
that's possible these days. I remember back in the 80s or 90s, we would, the way we would do corporate research would be we would write a letter to someone in Colombia asking them what this company did to them, and three weeks later we get a reply. And now it's instantaneous, right? We can share these kind of informations about about uh, corporate track records and, and strategies and tactics in dealing with them. Indian country today. Indian country today. Oh, I was going to, yeah, um, which is um, kind of temporarily on hold, but has a, a, a huge archives that's very, very accessible. And there are a lot of native journalists out there doing fabulous work. So maybe one last question, is that what, yeah. Uh, I wondered what your thoughts are. We were talking a little bit about the uh, Standing Rock and, and how the, uh, the Indians got attacked and everybody saw that. They you know, stick the dogs on them and were shooting them with all kinds of weapons, rubber bullets and everything. And, and uh, everybody was abhorred by that. And, then all the veterans came, you know, decided that they're going to come. And then, you know, all the police, a lot of the police and everything that uh, were on the other side uh, were veterans too. And so, you know, that dilemma that they're in of like shooting on their comrades, you know, firing on their comrades and everything, and the position that that may have put their... Uh, bosses and, and the politicians in North Dakota. Uh, do you have any more insight into that? Yeah, I've seen, we've seen all over the country where kind of bonds between Native and non-Native veterans is a very important way that this communication has happened. I remember in northern Wisconsin at the uh, Le Couture powwow, for instance, there were Vietnam vets who had not been, who had been kind of um, marginalized by their own white communities. Um, who for the first time found a home and found some respect um, in, uh, in the powwow um, arena. And, um, you know, that, that's a really profound thing, you know, honoring the warrior and not the war. And um, it's, uh, you know, you saw it standing rock, you saw this kind of in a very visible way, but I think it's done also in a smaller way. And I think that that's uh, something valuable that veterans can bring to the table. Um, is, is to build those bridges. Any other questions? Or? Yeah, I want to thank. <laughs> yeah, how many people here are, form, are former greeners? Evergreen, all right. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you for being here. And um, uh, Evergreen is a pretty amazing place, despite what you might read in the media, OK? <laughs> Well, I want to try and correct some of those perceptions. As, as just one example, um, we had a class uh, called, believe it or not, Resource Rebels, Environmental Justice Movements, Building Hope. Um, that was the name of our class. And we worked with the Quinault Nation. And we assumed that they would want us to do a project. We were doing interviews. We thought that they would want us to do a project around oil trains. Instead, they had us go and interview people in Aberdeen and Hoquiam, non-native people, about what kind of economy they want to build so they're not having to accept uh, polluting industries like oil terminals. Um, I'm now teaching a class called Aotearoa, New Zealand, Native Decolonization in the Pacific Rim. And in two weeks, we're taking 18 students to New Zealand uh, to work with Maori communities for two months. So um, there's a lot of amazing things happening at Evergreen, a lot of amazing people who um, graduated from Evergreen that are now here in Seattle who are movers and shakers and friends. And it's all beautiful to see you. Thanks for being here. And I want to take a picture of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Only this whole time we do that, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. <laughs>